And this is going to be Ron. Hello, Ron. You are up first. How's it going? Hey, Dylan. Good part. How are you? Pretty good. I want to give a background here with Ron. So when we did the Philly meetup and I came down to parks, this was a couple months ago with Michael, we went to Borgata on Saturday when I came down on Friday and uh, I want to play the 8160 OE game, which is half 08 and half stud 8. And Ron was a listener and he had contacted me about and helped me how to get into the game. So Ron is a regular in that game, but then Ron also plays No Limit when the game is not going. But I just wanted to touch on a couple of things before we start, Ron. First of all, no I know you've been a playing poker for a long time. Did you ever play with Doyle? Because if you're playing some of these high stakes mix games, maybe you've had a chance to cross paths with him. No, I have not. You had never that, that you ne opportunity. You never did. Yeah, he was not really much of an East Coast guy. And yeah. that's predominantly what I am is just East Coast. I don't right. I travel out to Vegas five, six times, mostly for golf trips and then some poker. Right. Uh, and and um again, you know, that that oh, that eighty one sixty game really only goes on the weekend. What I wanted to ask you really before we get into the no limit hand run was because of course I put out that video about the encore and sort of treating um the players and how poorly they have treated the players since covid and um there's been some i've heard some complaints about borgata since mgm has sort of taken it over and you were you know kind of telling me about how the game has struggled post covid because and when i remember way back when mabel used to host the game in the mid 2000s <laughs> Um, yep. they used to give free rooms for that game and that would help the game go because people would travel to play in the game and now they're not really doing it and the game's kind of dying down, right? Exactly. We lost a lot of people from New York. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Foxwoods wouldn't give them rooms or would give them poker rates. And if you add it up, it's a big chunk to come overcome uh, besides the rake and, and players. So right. they would travel down to Borgata where they would get free rooms on Friday and Saturday maybe you'd have to pay five ten dollars for whatever fees they had and that was it so basically it is a free room mm -hmm. uh they were like that all the way up until covid and then after covid we still kept our rankings but if you didn't come back immediately when they had the plastics dividers up yeah and i only went back once with the dividers it was horrendous i was seeing reflections of players chips next to me and cars it was I went once and that was it. And I just waited for them to come down. So basically I was a rank two, meaning I could walk up there any day except for a major holiday and I could get a room on any given day. Uh, but after that, my rank went all the way down to double digits and the rooms were scarce. They were now charging all of us. Uh, there were a couple players who did come every weekend and play with the dividers. Our game, the OOE, did not go at all, so they played other games. So they still kept their rank for another year or two, maybe a year and a half, and then it eventually fizzled out. And that's what's happened now where Friday is the main day because what's happening is people will spend $80, $90 on a room for Thursday night. Oh, okay. Or they'll spend $150 to $200 on a Friday night. Right. So you can get there the day before, sleep in, wake up, start the game, or you have the game, you play all night. I just want to say too, so we have a, a someone in the chat, Dave from New Jersey says, Bart, we do not want free rooms at the Borgata because it brings in too many euros. Games are fewer, but better. Well, that's an interesting take, Dave. <laughs> that's one take. Um, but Ron, you got a no limit hand for us, right? So tell us, this yeah. is a 2-5 game, is that right? 2-5 at Parks. Okay. Oh, 2-5 at uh, Parks, okay. At Parks, yeah. Okay. And as you know, that's my, my main game and my main study is the Omaha and Stud 8. So yeah. what I know, and it's funny with all these solvers and everything else and what I watch on you on TV and others, my mind was like in scrambles in this game. Like if I didn't hear any of this GTO stuff before, it wouldn't have been like even a question of what how I played the hand, even though I probably still played it the same way. But it made my brain go, get scrambled. Okay. So we were nine handed. Okay. Uh, I had 1,800. The effective stack was 600. Okay. Um, I was under the gun with Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Spades. All right. So Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Spades, under the gun. Okay. I raced to 20, which is my standard open. Okay. Uh, everybody folds mm -hmm. up to the, both blinds called. 
So small blind and the big blind call at two cool. five. Okay. So it's uh, sixty About sixty flop. bucks. Yep. Okay. And the flop is queen of clubs, queen of hearts, eight of clubs. Not a bad flop. So top trips, yeah. right? Ace queen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two clubs out there. You don't have a club in your hand. Obviously, there's some interior straight draws like jack ten and nine ten. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Both blinds check to me. Okay. I bet twenty five. Okay. Small blind calls. Okay. Big blind folds. So small blind calls, big blind fold. The only thing that I would say about that is, is that, you know, people shouldn't really be V pipping all that wide from the small blind. Obviously, you see that in live play. Also, the next to act call that would obviously be stronger. Um, tend to be stronger than the the big blind, but I mean, you don't really have a whole lot to worry about. I mean, if the guy's got a queen, that's great. You want to sort of pile money, and really, the only bad card for you here, you know, is a club or maybe one of these cards in between an eight and a queen that might come in. Sure. Yeah. He was definitely an OMC. Okay, OMC. Yeah. Uh, who just sat down? I'd say no more than a half hour ago. Okay. So I have absolutely no. I have never played with this gentleman before. I have no reads on him. Nothing. Okay, so let's move to the turn. Okay, turn seven of clubs. Uh, not the best card for you. <laughs> no, yep. and that's what I expected. Yep. He leads out for 100. So small blind leads here for 100. Now, that's not typical that you'll see somebody lead with a flush card, but I mean, I think at this point, I mean, you're only 600 deep, but I think the standard play here is to call. And that's what I did, but I took my time because, as you're saying, at these small stakes and every time I have played them, you're right. They don't bluff. It is a true hand. So I am like, okay, and here's where I said, prior to listening to all of this pot odds and am I getting the right odds for calling and everything else, if he's got a made hand, I'm drawing to nine outs. Well, ten outs. Right, you're drawing to 10 outs, but I mean, you are getting like, you know, you are getting two to one. Two to one. Right, you're getting Mm -hmm. two to one, but I don't think that we can just always give him a flush all the time here. Like he actually might have some, or he might have a straight draw that he's representing. I mean, I know you say he's an OMC, but there's no way that I'm folding now because I think your hand can sometimes obviously be good here too. Okay, but if I'm going, and this is where I, I really took my time and struggled with it. If I am saying, okay, this guy's got a pat hand. <laughs> a pat hand, okay, yeah. I, I haven't heard that term in a while. No, I, I mean, no. I know. <laughs> An old man's term. So yeah. <laughs> he's got a, if I'm giving him a pat hand, uh-huh. I'm drawing to uh, nine, 10 outs. Draw. Yeah, you need, so Three, in the six. quick way that, even the quick way that I actually do this, I do it a little Times bit different. Two, so 20%. Right. Right. And I do that a little bit differently where I, I go into like unseen cards where I'll say like, I've got 10 outs out of like 45 unseen cards, which means I've got, uh, I need 3.5 to one to, in order to make the call. The reason why I do it that way is because I real, I, I figure out in my head how much, if I am behind, how much I need to make from the pot by the end, if I'm behind. So when he goes 100 into 110, the pot's 210, you know, you have, you need to make 350 by the end of the hand. Um, when he bets a hundred, cause you know, you're calling a hundred. Well, when he puts a hundred into one ten, the pot's already two ten. So you're winning that. So you would only really need to make about one fifty to 200 more at the end to break even if you are behind. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when you call now, the pot is three ten. So it really only represents about a half pot size bet. The only thing about this is that of course, a lot of your outs aren't good outs. I mean, meaning that they'll make your hand, but the board will get double paired, right? I mean, the ace is really the only one, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that was the only way is that if I hit the ace, I felt that the implied odds would get over the actual odds. Right. To give me the right reason to call on that. And then I did call. So you make the call and the pot's 310. And again, again, this is a sort of a combination of you know, if he were to turn over a flush, like say he was one of these guys that didn't want the bad beat and he showed you a flush, yeah, you can fold, right? You can you can actually fold. But um, I don't think that we always know that. So the pot's like right around 310 to the river, okay? Correct. Mm-hmm. Jack of Diamonds is the river. 
Ah, okay. So the Jack of Diamonds is the river. Okay. And I was extremely shocked. He checked. So small blind checks. I mean, here's the thing. So, you know, at this point, I don't think a lot of flushes here are going to check all that much. And the, re- and the reason why, and again, you know, you might run into some people like this. Now, somebody might just be petrified of the nuts all the time and might be scared of Queen Jack. But this is different than if, for example, the guy made a flush and instead of the board being like Queen, Queen, Eight, it was like Queen, Queen, King. And then the turn was like an Ace. Or the turn was a jack, and he let out on a flush, and then the river was a brick. And now he was looking at two cards that, you know, that people would pip- yeah. yeah, you know, pe- people typically play with a queen that might be a boat here. But with only the jack out there, like, he's got to be some fucking nit to check there. So, I mean, I, I think I go for, I think I go for value. I mean, it looks like you, he's got probably, what, 400 to 450 left, something like that. That's what, that's what I am right there. Yeah, I mean, it kind of looks to me like he's got a queen here as played, and I probably would go 175 to 200, I think, here. I'm telling you, I'm sitting there, and I hear you in the back of my head. These are never bluffed. These kind of players and these kind of stakes at this level stakes are never bluffed. And I said, I don't know. I think I'm making the nittiest check there is. And I checked back. So hero checks behind, and what was the result? He turned over pocket sevens. Wow. Oh, my <laughs> God. That is crazy, I crazy, always... crazy. Let me ask you this question. So sure. if, if he comes out and bets 200 uh, at the end, were you going to fold? Yes, I was. Hmm. To him, th- th- I just. Interesting. I mean, even if he showed me queen seven, I, I could see that in his range as well. Here's Obviously, the, Queen Seven from as an OMC from the small blind calling from the small blind preflop. Well, yeah, I could uh, suited. I mean, more of a hand that I would think that might defend from the big blind. One last thing on this is that, and I'm not going to give this guy credit for this, but there are some smart o- OMCs that actually totally understand their image. And if you were an OMC with this type of image, you would want to take some value own lines. And what I mean by that is, is that you'd want to check a lot of strong hands because people are so petrified. Like you said, Ron, if the guy bet 200, if you would have just folded, if he can check and get you to value bet a worse hand, that's a good line for the guy. Now, I don't necessarily give that guy credit for doing that. Maybe it's accidental, but that comes into play as well. I understand. I agree with that. Yeah. I, I, if he is, and like I said, I played with him for 30 minutes. That's the extent I know this gentleman. And yeah. I, I just like it, everything he's saying at low stakes, these guys aren't bluffing. They don't know what it takes to bluff. Right. But it might not be a bluff. It might be a stop and go queen, though. Like that was the whole thing, like on the turn. That's why I think he probably would have gotten my money with but I also, bet. But I also thought if he had a queen, he would have check raised me because he's not giving me mm-hmm. a queen. Raising right. under the gun. Oh, that's a good point that he just flat calls with two flush cards out there. Um, uh, Ron, I appreciate the call and, and thanks again for helping Mike no and Mike G and I out in Borgata. And maybe we'll be down no there problem. again soon. Sounds good. Thanks a lot.